Okay, we're right at 9 a.m. Uh, Danny, should we go ahead and get started? I think that sounds great. All right, well, first of all, I'll introduce myself. I'm Dr. Donald Warren. I'm the Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. I'm also director of the Indians into Medicine or InMed program and director of the public health program here at UND. And we're very uh, happy and honored to have uh, this workshop going on today. We also have a lot of other exciting things going on. We have a brand new PhD in indigenous health and we have uh, our first cohort that just started this year. So we're very pleased at UND we have uh, uh, 19 first year PhD students in the Indigenous Health Program. And of the 19, 17 of them are American Indian. We also have eight first year medical students. So that means we have 25 first year doctoral students at UND who are American Indian, and focusing on uh, medicine and health sciences. So we're very pleased with that. One of our major research projects is what's called the Dakota Project. It's the Dakota Cancer Collaborative on Translational Activity. And it's focused on clinical and translational research. And the primary theme to this point has been around cancer, but it is being expanded to look at other community-based research priorities. So as part of that, we want to promote more uh, research that's clinical and translational that can actually have a direct impact on the health of, uh, of our people and the, address the terrible disparities that we're facing. So as I'm sure many of you know, it's, it's not that we need more basic science in Indian country, we need translational science. We need to take what we already know and implement it effectively to improve health outcomes. So that really is kind of the backdrop and the basis for this tribal IRB workshop. We want to promote culturally relevant and meaningful research, but we want to do it in the right way. So that again is kind of the, the backdrop for having this workshop. And I want to thank uh, Danny Thompson and Arun Bata for being so helpful in getting everything set up and organized. But at this point, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Danny, and she can introduce uh, the uh, the agenda as well as our first speaker. Sure. Well, I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker uh, first. Um, please welcome Melissa Buffalo. She is currently serving as the deputy director for the American Indian Cancer Foundation. Um, I think. I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, and if we have anything, uh, Melissa, I'm looking forward to a really great discussion and a really great presentation. And I will hopefully not goof up your slides. So here we go. <laughs> Good morning. Can you hear me? Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Happy to see so many familiar names. And some of us don't have our camera on. Valerie, Anita, super excited to be back in this space and talking about research. Um, I'll share a little bit about my previous role and how that plays a role in um, the work we do here at the American Indian Cancer Foundation, but super excited to um, kind of kick off this presentation and the conversations I've had with Danny um, in the last month. So really just kind of setting up all the great speakers today. So talking about resources and partners and ethical community-based research. Um, and I was a little nervous to share my screen, <laughs> so I have Danny sharing it for me. So you're gonna hear me say next slide oh, like 22 times. But again, my name is Melissa Buffalo. As Danny mentioned, I am the deputy director with the American Indian Cancer Foundation. We are a national organization. We are located um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I am an enrolled member of the Meskwaki Nation in Iowa. Uh, Dakota from the Crow Creek and Lower Blue Sioux tribes, um, born and raised in South Dakota. Um, I'm a mother of two to an eight and ten year old. So again, just thankful to be here today. So go ahead and next slide, Danny. I'm on the right screen. There we go. So just again, kind of overview and objectives for my presentation this morning, just to kind of talk about um, the American Indian Cancer Foundation, and that's ACAF for short. So just sharing a little bit about our vision, mission, and the work we do and the importance of research and partnerships within that, which will kind of transition into those relationships and how important those are when we want to do community-based research and how we're building those relationships across the board from the institutions, the academics, and the the tribal perspective side. So sharing a little bit about the work I previously did with some of the folks on the call today, uh, Collaborative Research Center for American Indian Health, which is Kirka for short, 
So super passionate about that work and love when the opportunity arises to talk about that. And then that will lead into the Our Ethics Training, which I believe now is just called the Ethics Training. So University of Washington, the Kirka Tribal Partners and I had the opportunity to be trained in the Our Ethics um, as Train the Trainers. So super fortunate to have that um, in our toolbox. So next slide. So again, a little bit about ACAF before we go into some of these relationships and the, the research training. So the American Indian Cancer Foundation is a national nonprofit established to address those tremendous cancer inequities faced by American Indian and Alaska Natives. Our mission is to eliminate those cancer burdens on American Indian families through education and improve access to prevention, early detection, treatment, and survivor support. Um, so a little bit about us. ACAP was founded in 2009 and became operational in 2011. Super excited. We're about to hit our 10-year mark. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and again, we are national. We are housed in Minnesota. We do um, did, you know, some of our best partnerships were started and established in Minnesota. And we're so thankful for those relationships and partnerships with uh, the Minnesota Department of Health, with the tribes, the Dakota and Ojibwe tribes here in Minnesota. Um, and as we do some of the work and the grants that we've received, starting to become more national and reaching more tribal communities across the nation. Super excited to share that all of our ACAF board members and the majority of our employees are American Indian with an array of expertise and experiences serving the health needs of our people. Um, next slide. Again, the vision of ACAF is a world where cancer is no longer a leading cause of death for American Indian and Alaska Natives. Through hard work, culturally, culturally appropriate community-based programs, and policy change that affords Native people access to the breast prevention and treatment strategies. We really do see a day where American Indian communities are free from those burdens of cancer. Um, and I do this work, I really, I love this work and I do it both personally and professionally. I look at the impact cancer has had on my immediate family, on my communities and the communities I live and work in. And I know there's not too many of us as Native people that can't say cancer hasn't impacted us. So the work I do really does, does happen outside the computer, away from the computer. It's you know not something I do from eight to five, but something I carry with me, who I am as a mom, a person, and a community member. So really value the work that we do here at ACAF. Uh, next slide, Danny. So when we think about that vision and mission, and we really have to know where we get this information from, and we look at those inequities um, that American Indian face when we think about data and then we think about that cancer data. So we really do face alarming inequities in cancer incidents and mortalities. So when we think about this work, we really need to start with the data when we talk about those health issues within our indigenous communities. And we all on this call, I'm pretty sure know that importance of having accurate data or any data at all. And, and we know the struggle to get that data within Indian country. You know, we know those are, there's so many reasons. Um, a lot of those come from being smaller sample sizes, racial misclassification. Um, and so when we look at that, we know that one of the big things as Native people we look at over the years across the nation for non-Natives, those cancer rates are going down for both incidence and mortality, but unfortunately for American Indians, those rates are increasing. Um, so it's unfortunate when we say that other populations within the U.S. have celebrated those decreasing cancer mortality rates again, but, um, and so just really seeing the importance of the work we do here at the foundation. Uh, next slide. I love this PowerPoint or this presentation in visual um, as Native people being able to see these visuals and how they come to life in our, in our uh, resources that we give. So at ACAF, we really understand that need to assess our ways of life as Indigenous people and being able to celebrate those um, when starting any new initiative. So we know that our worldview as Indigenous people has always been nonlinear when compared to the Western worldviews. Um, we really understand and know that that worldview as Native people as interconnect, interrelatedness, balance, and sustainability. And we know that those lifeways are rooted in culture and grounded in respect for all living things. 
Um, we know that indigenous people are often a collection in nature versus individualistic. Um, and you'll, you'll, when you get to know some of these communities, you really hear the we and you don't often hear that I. And so we think about that collective culture and really emphasizing family and work group goals versus those individual needs, whereas individual emphasizes that personal achievement. So again, just strengthening this connection really creates that opportunity for us to be healthier as Indigenous people and in the work we do. And we really use this um, worldview to guide the work we do at ACAF. Next slide. So when we think about, again, looking at that data and what are some of those root causes of that chronic disease, we really have to think about those adverse social determinants of health, um, the importance and, and role that historical intergenerational plays. So thinking about colonization, genocide, stress, disruption of childhood development, um, those adverse childhood experiences. I won't go too much because I'm pretty sure most of us on this call are familiar with all those, thinking about those behavioral risk factors, you know, what is that lack of physical activity, unhealthy eating and commercial tobacco use are some of the some of the topics and, and addiction, commercial tobacco again, alcoholism, drug use, unsafe sex. And then again, what are some of those poor health outcomes from those, that mental health, the physical health, the emotional and spiritual, depression, post-traumatic stress. So really, you know, looking at these, when we think about those root causes of chronic disease and how it's not just cancer, it's probably a combination of depression and diabetes when we're talking about some of these disparities and that they all have a role within each other. And then again, that again leads to early death. I look at losing my mom to cancer within three months when she turned 56. And that's probably been the hardest thing as a becoming a mom is losing my mom to cancer. So again, I look at all of these and how that plays a role in who I am. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> But we do have that, so we think about the, those negativities, but we also have health equity and we think about how we're serving our communities and being able to achieve that full health potential. And that is the reason why we're all on this call and the work we do. So we think about the importance of that balanced health, being able to break that cycle of trauma. And again, what are those social determinants of health? How are we helping our communities to see the strengths that they have that have been there for generations? So really using all of these to achieve that full health potential. Um, I won't go too much into these ones. I'll just let us kind of read through some of those. Um, so give about five seconds, Danny, and you can go ahead and go forward. So again, flipping back and kind of thinking about those persistent inequities. Um, so we know that American Indians face tremendous inequities in cancer and again, some of those other chronic diseases largely related to those health behaviors, smoking, eating, exercise, and again, what are those social determinants of health, education, job, safety. And we know that American Indians are too often on the worst end of every health, health indicator reported. Again, what is that access to health care, environmental quality, substance abuse? Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we're all here because we're working together to create positive change and promote those healthy norms in our communities and a lot of the research we do and, and being able to balance that with some of that community-based research. Um, next slide, please. Won't go into too many of these, but again, we go back to that trauma and what are some of those policies, systems, and environmental that have impacted American Indian, Alaska, Native communities, tribes. Um, Although we like to acknowledge that the state recognizes these deliberate efforts of the government to eradicate indig indigenous people from the US, we also know that there's policies and systems that were intentionally created um, that have a lasting impact that aren't only gonna impact us on the, on the call, but our future generations, our children and our gen grandchildren and how we're breaking those cycles. But being able to balance those and understand that these things did happen, um, so I won't go into too many of these, but the Indian Removal Act, the Allotment Act, the Indian Reorganization Deal, the Relocation Act, the Religious Freedom Act, looking at the commodity food system and, and how those impact our health equity, um, the boarding school era, that, that mantra of kill the Indian, save the man. Um, and I was happy to see that this picture was in one of a previous slide that um, Chris Johnson was using, our policy and prevention manager. We look at this picture and see um, 
Chairman uh, Gillette from one of the North Dakota tribes signing away over two, I want to say 200 or 300,000 acres of land to build the Garrison Dam. Um, and so he did his best to fight for that, that land and not give it up. But as you can see here, signing away that land to the government. And I like to talk, have folks when I'm giving this presentation, look at this picture, not only see the chairman crying, but we look at the faces of all the other people in the picture. And I'm always like, you know, what, it, what do we see? They just look like it's another opportunity to move on. It's just their everyday thing and it's nothing to them. Whereas the chairman, all the, the fighting he did to get to this point. So I always like folks to just take a couple seconds and look at this picture and reflect. Um, next slide. Um, so this is just kind of as ACAF, a lot of the work we use and we think about the importance of that data and where we got as Native people and how we're, we're using the information we have um, as part of our history and the data and how we're presenting that. So we think about cancer in American Indian and Alaska Natives again. We know that the number one cause of death for women um, is cancer followed by heart disease and unintentional injury. The number two cause of death for men is cancer, number one is heart disease, and three is unintentional injury. So then you see the most commonly diagnosed cancers for men and women, with con lung cancer being the leading cause of death, um, of cancer death for men and women. And again, just that visual of seeing the cancer rates for both a American Indian Alaska Natives and then non-Natives. And then our cancer burden booklet, and I will send this information to Danny that she can share out with all attendees. Um, we do break this information down by region and there are a little bit differences, but again, just seeing that overall um, diagnosis and cancer death rate by region. So having that information and how do we continue to keep this information and see the changes over time. So looking forward to being able to create another cancer burden booklet. Uh, next slide. So seeing, again, the work we do, we do have three teams, our cancer equity team, policy and prevention, as well as our research team. Um, I did start out as the cancer equity manager and recently moved into the deputy director role. So really seeing the importance of all of these and how they all inform each other. So really being able to look at cancer equity and being able to, at ACAF, really focus on that screening and early detection. So more of that prevention side, um, as we know, American Indians, when they are diagnosed with cancer, it's at those later stages. So how can we move that needle back and be able to really look at um, advocating and raising that capacity and increasing awareness for screening at those, those age ranges and what that means for our communities. So we do that as well as balancing that work in the community with clinic systems improvement. So how can we go in and look at kind of what are some of those barriers to get um, our loved ones in the door and to get screened on time? So how are we looking at um, patient reminders, provider reminders, making small changes to improve the system and who's all inv involved in some of those reminders and getting our loved ones into the clinic as well as we remove, reduce some of those barriers, access to care, you know, transportation, um, financial, those barriers are, take up, not take up a lot of our time, but it's, you know, we, we do our best to, to bring that understanding to the work we do and to the grantors of those barriers, being able to remove those in order to get those improvements made in the clinic system. Um, policy and prevention team really aims to engage, educate, and empower our Native communities to implement healthy lifestyle practices that can really help reduce those cancer risks um, within our tribal communities. So the, can the policy and prevention team really provides technical assistance to tribes and some of those Native orgs within the U.S. in developing tribal resolutions and policies that improve health outcomes. They've also led some of the, the policies at ACAF, such as our health and wellness policy, as well as our cancer screening policy. So allowing our staff time, paid time off to get those, those screenings when the time is there. And again, our policy and prevention team does their best to utilize those culturally appropriate resources to engage the community members um, and stakeholders and inspire that policy systems environmental changes. Um, 
Right now, a lot of the work that our policy and prevention staff focus on is tobacco cessation, healthy eating, in, and physical activity. Um, and then our research program has focused a lot on some of that tobacco and commercial tobacco use, um, just with our CEO's um, research and previous um, experience has been a lot with some of that tobacco work. But our research program works with communities to identify some of those research questions um, methods and what are some of those funding opportunities out there. Um, so it's been exciting to have some of those conversations and see how some of our research can go into some of that clinic systems improvement. Um, it's been exciting to be a part of those conversations and being able to ask some of the, the scientists and the, the oncologists and other folks that were involved with of really trying to get at, you know, why why research in this community? How is it going to benefit that community? And, you know, what are, what are those outcomes going to show? So being able to ask those questions back before we can um, get to the actual research. And I know Anita is going to talk about that today. And I think some of the other conversations that are going to happen later on today. So I'm excited for those. Um, next slide, Danny. <coughs> so again, when Danny and I were talking, really understanding the importance of the work we do at Kirka, or not at Kirka, haha, at ACAF and how the previous work at Kirka partnered and thinking about those partnerships and collaboration and the importance of that and really understanding how all of this work kind of combines together and just really makes um, the work we do important and valued when we can carry all of those things. Um, next slide. So, so at ACAF, when we really think about that approach that we do, we really believe that Native communities do have that wisdom to find those solutions to those cancer inequities, but oftentimes are seeking the organizational capacity expert import, input and resources to do so. Um, at ACAP, we support innovative community-based interventions that really engage our Native populations in the discovery of their own best cancer practices. So we know that a project that works in northern Minnesota will be totally different from something on the east coast, west coast, or even in the southwest. So really being um, appreciative of that and understanding that importance that we carry across all our teams. And we really do strive to be a partner that's trusted by our tribal and urban community members, leaders, healthcare providers, and others working towards that effective and sustainable cancer solutions for our loved ones. So when we think about this approach, we really want to take that time to educate in understanding the past and the future and what's going on right now in each community. Understanding again, what does that community want? What do they need right now? Is this topic on the back burner? Does it need to be at the front? And how do we balance that with what is going on in each community? Um, how are they making those decisions? You know, do they have all the information in front of them? Are they able to, what are their resources that they have? And then again, this data that we're wanting, are the folks wanting to get, you know, how is that gonna improve the community? How will that improve the health and wellness of their community? So really being able to take all these approaches as well as ask the right questions when we're partnering with communities or when we get approached by others who wanna do re cancer research in some of these communities. Um, next slide. So a lot of this work that I do now when I think about research and I get super excited and I don't even consider myself a nerd, but I love it when I think about um, research in tribal communities and, and the things that I've learned. And it's not so much the education, but those partnerships and that, that time with all of our tribal partners through Kirka and the importance that I've learned um, in that work, I think, in all those conversations when I really want to bridge ACAF, Kirka, and the importance of research in tribal communities. So um, I want to say most of us on this call are familiar with the Collaborative Research Center for American Indian Health. It was a um, formed in 2012 with a grant from the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities. And the mission of Kirka was designed to create a platform to bring together tribal communities and health researchers from multiple disciplines to work together in conducting cutting edge transdisciplinary research that address the significant health disparities experienced by American Indians in South Dakota, North Dakota, and Minnesota. So again, the goal of Kirka was to help build that tribal research infrastructure and again, 
through that, you know, really helping tribes and health researchers build those strong relationships needed to plan and carry out research um, within those um, health issues and disparities and understanding those. Um, wanted to mentor tribes in the aspects of research and provide technical assistance. So again, that the tribes could develop and conduct future research. But I want to say that it wasn't only us mentoring the tribes as I looked at um, the work I led, but also learning from them. They mentored a lot of us in those research as much as we mentored them through this work. Um, they, we supported three innovative research projects that addressed um, that again, we're regional to those three states, and then support and monitored pilot grant program, um, which I think some of the folks on this call were part of those pilot grantees. Um, next slide. Um, just a quick infographic, I'll let folks, hopefully it's, we don't have to squint our eyes too much, just again, just giving an overview. Um, the map shows the red, red are the tribes that were funded um, throughout the five years, um, and then the yellow Cheyenne River, Spirit Lake, were um, Kirka tribal partners at least for one to two years. And again, just thinking about the core values, those transdisciplinary sustainability and tribal sovereignty, really giving the tribes the authority to make those, de those best decisions as we created some of the resources and tools for this um, work. So we had the administrative team, um, research, community engagement, um, the, the research, no, I, mean, I can't even read that, methodology core and the, oh my god, my eyes are not good. So I will send this, Danny, to you, <laughs> and then you could send this information out. But again, thinking about those core values and that, core values and the overall mission of Kirka and how understanding the importance of those relationships and those conversations that happened throughout my five years, four years there. Um, and that played a big role in the work I do now here at ACAF. Um, next slide. So again, some of the major resources that came out of um, Kirka was a tribal IRB toolkit, the data management toolkit. And again, just the, that community engagement, being able to have those conversations with various community members, stakeholders, and folks that really were key in understanding where research was going to go in those tribal communities. Um, overall, Kirka held six annual summits, two small community conferences, um, the work that a lot of the tribal members did to carry that research, not only within in their tribal communities, but, you know, sh speaking at regional and national conferences. So really just allowing Anita and others to really share that information and be the leaders in the work that was happening at Kirka. Um, and again, just developing those and disseminating those webinars, trainings, and toolkits and, toolkits and some of the lessons learned through some of the publications that came about through the end, at the end of Kirka. Um, next slide. So it's super excited again about today and, and what those conversations are going to bring. At the end of um, Kirka, we really, a lot of us had the opportunity to become trainers in um, what we were trained as our ethics, but now it's called ethics when you do go onto the website, ethics for a health and in indigenous communities. So we know that ethics, um, was the aim was to strengthen that research capacity and increase community involvement in some of the NIH funded research by developing and validating a culturally adapted ethical research training that is relevant and accessible to American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Um, so using this community engaged approach, this study addressed some of those ethical challenges in conducting um, American Indian Alaska Native based research, again, by increasing community involvement in research and understanding that and what is that research oversight, design, implementation and dissemination. So we know that um, ethics has the potential to, to increase AIA and participation in federally funded research through that culturally adapted online research training. Um, and I think some of the folks will talk about that today. Um, I really enjoyed being able to become a train the trainer in this research, not only for the knowledge, but I think a lot of the conversations we had in the training and then with some of the, um, the training we got to give to some of the other communities and just the conversations that came for this on both ends as being somebody who was trained in this, but as well as 
looking at some of those tribal IRB members who've been on those those boards from the beginning and and how this balanced the conversations and the training that we were able to provide. Um, next slide. Um, so pull this from the um, module one. So again, just the purpose of our ethics when we learned it was to present that culturally developed research training. Again, that will prepare researchers to conduct ethical research with American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Um, love that this was written for and by American Indian and Alaska Native community members conducting research with AIAN communities. Again, understanding the importance and knowledge and history that AIAN folks carry and that research has always been part of our communities and isn't something new. Um, and that it also, you know, the purpose is to really help understand how researchers and communities can respect, respectfully learn from each other. And I think that's it. When we gave this training and we were learning about this training, again, just those conversations that came from this and being able to learn, as well as a lot of the things I learned from some of the tribal IRBs and the importance of the questions they ask when being presented with research um, projects and how those are going to play out in each community. Um, next slide, please. So when we were given this module, um, there was there are six modules to this in introduction in history, um, codes and regulations, again, understanding what is human subjects research, and again, what are those institutional review boards, as well as what are tribal IRBs and how may the, and how might those differ? Um, respects for person and communities. So understanding and informed consent and how we document it. Um, beneficence. You know, what are those risks and benefits of research and how is that going to impact the community, ensuring that confidentiality and that we're managing those risks. And again, taking an importance that cultural consideration when doing research. Um, justice, fair access to research for all. So understanding those vulnerable populations, pregnant women, fetuses, prisoners, prisoners, excuse me, and children as defined by those federal regulations. And as we think about um, fair access we, we you know we want to understand how do children what is children's role in some of this research and again who's considered a child the parent and the guardian and then conclusion is again just kind of what were some of those unanticipated problems in research and we were able to review case studies and then just tying all of this together um next slide so again, I think about this work and the importance that I have at ACAF and the role I play in the work that we're doing with all of our staff and the importance that they have when they're working in the communities and, you know, being able to bridge that work with what I learned at Kirka, as well as that overall importance in research in tribal communities that we know we need that data and how are we going to get there and how are we going to improve our communities and be able to use data to apply for grants and to tell a story and being able to disseminate that back to our communities is I think the most important thing and how are we sharing it with our elders, our grandmas, you know, everyone in the community. So the work we do, I really feel um, not only at ACAP, you know, we talk about healing with culture and reclaiming that indigenous health, but I look back at all of the work that we've done through Kirka and the importance of research in tribal communities. And it is really healing with that culture and being able to reclaim indigenous health because we are all researchers. Um, and I realized, Danny, I talked really fast and I think my, this was my last slide. So really just again, emphasizing and wanting to bridge all three of these together as we set up the conversations for today with Anita talking about um, ethical research and human subjects, you know, looking at the importance of IRBs and what are those relationships, as well as some of the community engagement pilot projects that would be talked about today. So hopefully if you guys have questions, you can go to the next slide. I am able to answer those. <laughs> if not, I'll be, it'll be a get back to you later. But again, I just wanted to thank Dr. Warren and Danny for this opportunity and sharing this information and all those folks that I've interacted with at Kirka, ACAF, and through past and future research. So, Pilamia. Very good. And thank you so much for sharing all the information and your experiences. And it's uh, heartwarming to see so many of our people in these roles and really advancing the, the need for 
uh, culturally relevant and meaningful research that's going to have a positive impact in our communities. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do have a question about the, our ethics. I, I'm so excited that that's available now and that we can have an uh, indigenous focused approach to uh, human subjects protections and community protections. Do, do you know, um, have some universities, are they now accepting our ethics um, in place of the city training, you know, the collaborative uh, institutional training initiative? Or is it kind of used more as a supplement to the city? Or do you know um, how that's being used in, in approvals? Yep. I want to say there was one before I left Kirk, and I don't remember what or, uh, institution that was, but it was supposed to be in place of the city in a supplement because, again, trying to share that importance of this, not as something that was less or more, but equal to the city training. And I'm going to ask Anita if she, she might have input on this one as well or not, <laughs> as I'm looking at you. <laughs> I know you're waiting for me to turn on my video. <laughs> I feel distracted with my texting right now, so I, I didn't want to interrupt you with, with that. But um, no, I actually don't know of any universities that are actually replacing it with the city training. Um, I think one of the big challenges that we faced with that was it came at the end of our time with Kirka mm -hmm. and um, if we would have had just one year to promote it um, even myself I, it's been difficult to fit it into the scheduling and we've been working on trying to get it online so that um, people can uh, participate in that prior to doing research in our community so mm -hmm. I think a lot of times it's this the challenge of um, tribal programs and, and tribal organizations and IRBs just having so much multiple um, jobs and multiple things to do that we do a lot of things, but we need to work on doing all those things a lot better. <laughs> and, and one of our goals over the next year or two is to really get that promoted and out to the community, so. Very good. And uh, Danny, maybe do you want to talk a little bit about the opportunity for the our ethics training through the Dakota program and how we've got that set sure. up now? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, as of this spring, uh, we were actually able to work with University of Washington um, and Dr. Pearson, who sort of coordinates the our ethics training and convert or at least create uh, an online training. We the, combine the six modules into three sort of palatable sized um, online training uh, sessions. Uh, so it is still the standard full like six hour training, but um, you know, we were able to get that into an online delivery module. So um, you can go to the UND uh, continuing medical education site and I'll put that in the chat here in just a second. So um, if you do have any students or someone that, that needs a primer on ethical human subject research or maybe wants to refresh, um, again, taking in some of those considerations there, what, what is going to be beneficial for communities working in research that maybe haven't historically had the best experience um, you know, we are able to do that online, which it was sort of timely given that now everything is done online. So I'm glad we were able to get that up and accessible. Um, and, you know, we will be offering regular sort of in-person wrap-up discussions um, at, at intervals to be determined. Um, but, you know, one of the things that really is a, is a benefit out of that training is having the opportunity to, to talk to other people about their experiences, to, you know, share ideas, to share experience, to share um, training. So we're going to combine that online with, you um, you know, in-person live sort of wrap-up discussions at some point, but it is available, it is online at Q, uh, Continuing Medical Education, and I will put that in the chat here shortly. Very good, thank you so much. All right, well, we can open it up. If anybody has uh, questions for Melissa, please feel free to either speak up or raise your hand virtually or type something in the chat. So if you, any questions or clarifications? Melissa, uh, just capitalizing on what Danny said about the in-person part of um, the art ethics or the ethics training for tribal communities. That was um, something that we really struggled with towards that with, with the ethics training was how are we going to get that tribal component that that on the ground that tribal aspect from the tribal communities um, into the training, you know, that that was always a concern for me um, from from my perspective is that the, you know, 
we don't want to make it like for me, I didn't want it to be just another city module training, <laughs> you know, um, that it, it had to have that meaning behind those discussions um, mm -hmm. that you have at the tribal level, you know, and um, just that was, you know, I'm glad you, you mentioned, you know, that, that that piece of it is really important because I think that was the initial intent of it, you know, was mm -hmm. to make sure we had that, um, that we had a base camp and then we were able to develop it at our own level um, for our own communities so that um, you could put in those extra pieces in there and, and have those discussions. Right. Yeah. And I remember the first training we gave um, with OST. Um, and I think, you know, we looked at the six modules for that one day and we realized from eight to 12, I was still talking on the introduction module. So the importance of those conversations, Anita, were so valuable and important when we first did it. And to be able to reflect on that and build that, I think is so needed. Danny, has any discussion taken place with the uh, UND IRB? or that office uh, about the uh, modules that are available? Um, not yet, we approached the department. Um, we haven't had a meaningful discussion yet. Um, I think right now, given all the changes that are going on with COVID-19 and their protocols that are getting updated, I think it's, it's going to be a timely conversation when we do have it. Um, so I'm optimistic, but we haven't had a chance to get a lot of traction just yet. Okay, I can help to facilitate that. Yeah, as you can imagine, all of the challenges doing any types of human subjects research during a pandemic uh, is taking up a lot of the energy and uh, capacity at the moment. So hopefully we'll get through the pandemic and we've, we've built our capacities around conducting research more appropriately moving forward. So I, I think there'll be some good reception here at UND for the, for the trainings. Right, any other questions or comments for Melissa or anyone else? Not hearing any. So we are a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, we have a pretty good group already, 30 people on at the moment. Um, should we just consider maybe moving into the, the next area of discussion or Danny, did you have anything else that you wanted to address? Um, I didn't, you know, our, our 10 a.m. session is, is going to be a panel discussion and I think, you know, Melissa gave us a really great entry um, into what's going to be sort of coming up here at the 10 o'clock. Uh, if people want to take a break, certainly they can. Um, I'll put up the, the pause screen here, but you know, it looks like we've got a pretty good crowd and I think you know, I always vote in favor of expediency, so. Yeah. Well, Melissa, any other uh, last comments or takeaway messages that you wanted to share? That's a really good question. Not offhand. <laughs> I'm, again, just thankful for this opportunity, and I think we're all here to bring our expertise and understand that you know, again, our communities have that knowledge and wisdom and that they, you know, it's just being able to ask the right questions and how we're going to disseminate that information back to our communities. So. Actually, I have a question for you, Melissa. Um, you know, thinking as I do, I often get calls from you know, potential applicants to the Dakota, um, people that are just trying to sort of find their feet as far as um, starting a reliable and um, useful human subjects project and hopefully community-based. So, I know in my own experience that, that ACAF has always been ready to, to step in if I need help sort of establishing my network. But if somebody is out there just sort of looking for, you know, who do I even talk to? Where do I start? Or I know your office probably is a really great place to start among some others. Um, but are you in a position to connect people with um, RRBs or IRBs or even just, you know, research partners? If, if it's not your office, I'm sure you, you know the right people to connect with. Yeah, and again, it goes back to, you know, the where, what region of the nation we're doing that research and the importance, but I, you know, do my best to always share the Kirka Tribal Partners, so OST, Rosebud, um, Anita's Tribal, Re our Turtle Mountains, um, TNRG, 
and we know, you know, Spirit Lake was getting their, I think their IRB was through the universe, through their college. But again, just, you know, ensuring that folks are doing their research to see if there is an IRB or who um, oversees the research projects, if it's the health board. Um, but yeah, I definitely can do my best to make some of those connections if folks need it. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, I have, I have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I'm working, uh, I'm actually a grad student um, currently working at Dakota and I am uh, for my scholarly project, I'm working uh, in a cancer research that is uh, trying to say if American Indian population in Rulet County has high incidences of um, any sort of uh, any cancer in respect to North Dakota as a whole. And while going through the literatures, I found that uh, there was the, I, I was trying to I was trying to figure out whether or not the medical expenditure is greater among American Indians or how much expenditure is there on in case of cancer care. And I found that uh, there was this website, MERS, which basically looks after the medical expenditure in all of the diseases in the US, but uh, they have grouped um, American Indians. I, I don't know, there was not separate um, American Indian uh, race or ethnicity in, that, in, in their database. And I found that really strange. And I'm, I might be unaware about the situation because I'm new to new here. So, is it something common or I was just well, I was just curious because they were not they didn't have a separate race or that was quite curious for me and is it is it serious or is anything done uh, in this regard yeah I see a couple folks shaking their heads so I'll let others give their input as well but understanding when you know that American Indians across the whole U.S. nation make up about 1% of the population. So sometimes that people pulling this information together just doesn't see that 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 number is significant enough to share, but to our tribal communities it is. And I know you're talking about um, Turtle Mountain, a county within Turtle Mountain, so I'm going to let Anita answer this one. And then I see um, Jackie shaking her head as well. So I think there's other experts, but I think it's, again, understanding that importance of that the folks thinking that number is too small to to share that information in a publication. Oh, you're on mute, Anita. <laughs> First of all, there's a, a review process um, that would need to be followed. And then once you follow that review process, we probably can help you um, figure out a good way to get some of that data, maybe from IHS, um, from um, contract health records. Um, I'm sure Don has some good ideas on how to have access to it and, and identify some of that data. Um, so I think it's important that, and, and you'll see through some of the presentations today, the importance of, of working closely with the IRBs and um, just understanding them as a resource rather than um, a hurdle, <laughs> you know, uh, that we could help get your research um, to where you want it to be and help you find some of that data. Yeah, and I think some of the challenges uh, with data is that the, uh, the way we classify American Indian Alaska Native uh, uh, people and data is different depending on the data set. So if you look at U.S. Census data, that's self-reported. If you look at enrolled tribal member, that's different than census data. So enrolled tribal members really is a political status, whereas American Indian or Alaska Native on the census is a, a racial status. And then we have IHS data, which is a, a good data set but it does not include all American Indians and Alaska Natives. So for example, I live in Grand Forks. There are no IHS facilities locally. So I actually haven't gone to an IHS facility probably in 10 years in Rapid City. So I'm technically not in the IHS database as an active user. So I'm American Indian on the census. I'm an enrolled tribal member in my tribal data set, but I'm not in the IHS data set. So we have to be really cognizant of who is included in each data set. And, Common data sets like BRFAS also historically have undercounted and we've had less participation in behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Historically, that was a landline based telephone survey system. So populations that don't have landlines are not included historically. Um, 
So, so there's all kinds of challenges in the data, but it's a really good point is that we can't just assume that all data sets that list American Indians, Alaska Natives are consistent. And then we have many data sets that don't include us at all. But I'd love to hear Dr. Gray's perspective on this. You've been doing this for quite a long time. Yeah, a, a lot of, especially national types of studies and data sets will uh, list us as an asterisk that there's not enough to analyze. So that's pretty much the way we've been considered across most national data sets, a lot from what Melissa and Anita said, you know, the, the small numbers that they consider, you know, the one to two percent too small to analyze and uh, that they don't have the data because of how it's um, listed in so many places and then because of the representation on it that it's it's not complete and then there's misidentification within the other systems as to whether the person is white or native or latinx or you know where they fit so there are all those complications to getting the data thanks sir yeah and I do see uh, Dr. Best on as well. I know he's got a long history of working in these arenas. I don't know if you had any thoughts or comments just on some of the data challenges. Yeah, thank you, Don. Um, well, it's challenging <laughs> for, you know, through the research of the, uh, uh, the practical difficulties of obtaining access to data, uh, particularly in the Indian Health Service, but elsewhere as well. Um, Privacy regulations and the uh, you know the, uh, the control over over the data sets is is pretty uh, pretty daunting. Very good. All right. Any other questions or comments for Melissa related to this discussion? I don't see any. 